Am I saying that properly, Dr. Levy? Yes, that's correct. And Dr. Levy, are you currently outside the state of Florida? Yes. What state are you in? Massachusetts. Okay, Dr. Levy, uh, I'm a judge in the state of Florida, and my ability to uh, administer an oath only extends to the boundaries of the state of Florida. However, if you agree, I am allowed to administer the oath to you, but what that means is you need to consent to personal jurisdiction here in Sarasota County, Florida, for any sort of enforcement action, or let's say there's a criminal action for perjury against you. So understanding that you would be submitting to the personal jurisdiction of the state of Florida, do you agree I can administer the oath to you? Yes, I do. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you give is the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you very much. I'm now going to bring in the jury. Everybody. Members of the jury, I want to confirm while you're away, you did not discuss this case amongst yourselves, you did not do any investigation, and you received no information. Is that correct? Correct. And no one approached you about this case. Is that correct? Correct. And you've not seen any media accounts about this case. Is that correct? Correct. And uh, Mr. Shapiro. Sure, thank you. We called Dr. Sharon Levy. Okay. And members of the jury, you see Dr. Levy via zoom on the screen in front of you. I just want to let you know outside of your presence, I did administer the oath to her. And so she is testifying under oath. Mr. Shapiro, you may inquire. Sure. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, uh, good afternoon, Dr. Levy. Will you please introduce yourself to the jury? Yes, um, my name is Sharon Levy. I am a pediatrician and uh, an addiction medicine specialist. And I practice at Boston Children's Hospital uh, in Massachusetts. Okay, let me walk you through a little bit about that. Um, what's your current title at Boston Children's? I am the chief of the Division of Addiction Medicine at Boston Children's Hospital. Okay, so we'll, let's go backwards a little bit. Where did you get your undergraduate degree? At the University of Pennsylvania. And what did you graduate with? I graduated with a Bachelor of Arts degree. And what did you do for education after your BA from University of Pennsylvania? I uh, went to medical school at New York University. Okay. And uh, what year did you graduate from NYU? 1992. And did you do any internship uh, training after that? I did. Um, I uh, did a, uh, an internship, a residency, and a chief residency uh, in pediatrics at uh, Bellevue Hospital NYU Medical Center. And what does that mean to be chief uh, resident? Uh, in, in pediatrics, chief resident is uh, an honorary position. It's a fourth year uh, of, so it's an extra year of residency training uh, where uh, you become responsible for overseeing your uh, fellow residents, your, your more junior residents. Did you do any fellowship training after your internship and residency? I did. Um, at Boston Children's Hospital, I did uh, what was called a uh, pediatric advocacy training fellowship, which uh, really was equivalent to, I, I think in many ways, what we would call a developmental behavioral pediatric uh, fellowship today. And um, do you hold any board certifications? I do. I am board certified in developmental behavioral pediatrics and also in addiction medicine. Do you also hold a master's degree? I have a master's degree in public health from the Harvard School of Public Health. And um, what's your current title? Well, let me back up for a minute. When you were doing your 
uh, training at Boston Children's. Is that affiliated with Harvard Medical School? Yes, that is one of the uh, hospitals affiliated with Harvard Medical School. Um, what's your current title at Boston Children's? So I am the chief of the division of addiction medicine at Boston Children's Hospital. Okay. Is, is that a unique position in, in terms of its affiliation with the hospital? It is. So uh, the Division of Addiction Medicine was created in the Department of Pediatrics at Boston Children's Hospital just this past July. Uh, before that, we had been a, a program uh, within a, in a larger division. Um, we are uh, the first uh, division of addiction medicine at a pediatric hospital in the United States. Have you uh, contributed any publications to the medical literature? I have. Okay. Do you have a rough count of how many, approximately? Uh, I would say well over 100. Okay. And what does it mean to have peer-reviewed literature? So peer-reviewed uh, literature means that uh, the journal has sent out uh, a manuscript uh, to have it reviewed by people who are experts in the field. Um, typically, they will give comments and, and suggestions, uh, and often, uh, often manuscripts are revised based on having some uh, outside expert look at it prior to publication. And have you contributed any topics to any textbooks? I have. I have, I believe... Without looking, without doing a formal count, I, you know, I believe I've written more than uh, 20 or 30 textbook chapters. And I also serve as an associate editor of the Principles of Addiction Medicine, which is the, uh, the core textbook for the field of addiction medicine. And you mentioned to me um, about a, a special recognition from the White House recently. What was that about? Yes, a number of years ago, I was recognized by the White House of some national drug control policy for contributions to the field of P uh, to the field of addiction medicine uh, around uh, developing the field of pediatric addiction medicine. So, in this case, I sent you some medical records and some documents to review. Have you reviewed them in preparation for your testimony? I have. And do you have a rough account of how much you've um, billed or, or will bill to this point? So I, going back to 2019, uh, when I first uh, started looking at this case, the total has been a, a roughly uh, about $10,000 okay. for the past four years or so. So um, let me ask you about some of your opinions. Are you familiar with uh, the drug ketamine? I am. Is ketamine addictive? Yes, ketamine is a psychoactive drug that is addictive. Okay. When you say psychoactive drug, um, what do you mean by that? So a psychoactive drug, I'm referring to any drug that can cause release of dopamine in the brain's pleasure and reward center. So any drug that can do that um, will uh, will have the potential to be addictive. When we use the word addiction, can you explain to the jury what does that mean when you say something's addictive? Yeah, so um, actually, uh, the um, a little bit of background here, if I may. The technical diagnoses we use in the field of addiction medicine are actually substance use disorder. Um, so this is uh, a, a diagnosis that's made by um, a checklist of 11 items that really speak to um, trouble controlling use, having use of a substance interfere with day-to-day uh, -day functioning or interpersonal relationships, um, or uh, substance use that's dangerous. Um, so there are 11 criteria we ask. You know, patients come in when we're evaluating them for substance use disorder. Uh, we take a history and see if they've met these criteria. And that's how we make a formal diagnosis of a substance use disorder. The term addiction is not precisely defined. Generally speaking, people use it to mean loss of control over substance use. 
Um, and so I think many people may have, uh, may, may know of people who have become addicted to nicotine, um, who will do things um, to continue to use nicotine even, uh, even if uh, even if the nicotine use, for example, isn't pleasurable. So uh, the, the issue around addiction is that uh, it can really uh, change someone's behavior. And so uh, I, I think, you know, and, uh, some people might think of when they hear addiction, some people might think of a uh, clinical picture of somebody who's addicted to heroin who uh, might, um, uh, might really do some... Um, who, uh, in order to obtain or use heroin, might really do some things that are um, really not typical behavior. For example, um, you know, they might, um, uh, you know, rob or steal to get money to buy heroin or to get the drug itself. I, sometimes it's a much more subtle thing. Again, like someone who's become addicted to nicotine might, you know, stand out in the middle of a, a storm to smoke because they're not allowed to smoke indoors, right? So it's loss of control over behavior, sometimes with uh, really, you know, kind of uh, fulminant changes in behavior. I, I would like to say, though. Objection, Your Honor. The narrative. Okay. Sustained. Yeah. So let me let me ask you about in terms of ketamine's addictive properties, can you describe to the jury what those would be? What, why would ketamine be addictive? So, so all substances that can cause release of dopamine in the brain um, can be addictive. So uh, it, 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 the, it turns out that changes in the neurons of the part of the brain that's uh, called the, the pleasure and reward center um, can actually result in the clinical picture that we call addiction, right? So what's happening in those cases is that substance use um, is is kind of being, you know, the, for lack of a better word, it's being misfiled by the brain, and it's now being put into um, the category of life-sustaining behaviors, um, it, which would include things like breathing and uh, eating and drinking. When that happens, uh, the, 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 the subconscious parts of the brain start to protect the behavior. So I, I, it, when you're... Uh, yeah, so let me, let me ask you about that. When you say the subconscious part of the brain protect behavior, what are you referring to, doctor? Yeah, thank you. So, uh, you, you know, I, if you try and hold your breath, um, for too long, at some point, your reflexes in your brain will take over and you'll start breathing again, right? Because um, for life-sustaining behaviors, your brain is going to go, it's going to make sure that those behaviors um, don't get interrupted. The same, when you become addicted to a substance, your brain starts protecting that substance use and your, and it will, the, the more primitive parts of your brain will take over from the higher order parts of your brain that normally control behavior to ensure that you um, get to substance use if needed. Is, is there a particular risk of addiction in the immature brain versus the mature brain? There is. So the, um, so the, uh, the part of the brain called the prefrontal cortexes, that's the part of the brain that houses what we call executive functions, those are things like impulse control, error monitoring, that part of the brain is developing in adolescence through early adulthood, and that process in most people is thought to conclude somewhere around age 25, so in the mid-20s. While that part of the brain is still maturing, it, it's, so it turns out that that part of the brain is, is, can protect against some of the changes of, in the pleasure and reward center that are associated with this loss of control or the clinical picture of addiction. When the, once those parts of the brain, the prefrontal cortexes are mature in adults, they provide some protection to the, uh, to the other, uh, against the, uh, the changes that we see in addiction. So 
Um, in younger people, while that part of the brain is still maturing, there's, uh, they are more susceptible to developing addiction. And in fact, for every substance that we look at, we know that um, the younger you are when you start using a substance, the greater your chance of developing a substance use disorder that's been shown for alcohol, cannabis, opioids, other substances. So in terms of the actual physiologic effect, are you able to tell the jury whether ketamine can cause problems such as cell death in the brain? Yes. So uh, ketamine can cause uh, apoptosis, particularly in um, uh, younger animals. So apoptosis is programmed cell death, um, and uh, uh, ketamine accelerates that process. In terms of um, both short-term and long-term, let's talk about short-term. Are you able to educate the jury about what the short-term effects are of ketamine use? So short-term effects typically include um, psychotic symptoms, um, things like delusions, hallucinations, or out-of-body experiences. Um, it it uh, can also include uh, memory impairment um, on a physiologic level. Uh, ketamine can increase heart rate and slow respiration. Why does ketamine cause memory impairment? I, so, uh, the, so ketamine is um, a blocker of a receptor in the brain that's called NMDA. Um, uh, and uh, when that receptor is blocked, um, get all kinds of physiological consequences secondarily, and memory loss is uh, is one of them. Can um, does does ketamine cause respiratory depression? Yes, ketamine slows respiration. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about longer term, uh, more chronic use of ketamine. Can you educate the jury of what some of the risks are of long term ketamine use? Yes, so uh, people uh, who uh, use ketamine in the long term are, uh, can develop uh, problems with cognition, problems with memory, uh, psychotic disorders, and mood disorders. Um, Clay, are you able to put up uh, Exhibit 1046-004? And, and doctor, I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but I'll ask you, I provided you with a copy of Dr. Lewis's report. Um, and um, one moment, did you see, they're, they're pulling it up real quickly here. On the second full paragraph, it says, thus the presence of processing speed deficits are likely occurring as a result of at least two etiologies Dr. Lewis talks about uh, psychomotor slowing. Is that something that can be uh, a known uh, effect of ketamine? Objection. One expert com commenting on another's. Overruled, please. Um, so, yes, that can be a consequence of ketamine, ketamine use, ketamine exposure. And you talked about mood disorder. Uh, what's the link between uh, long-term ketamine use and mood disturbance? So I, people who use ketamine chronically are more likely to have mood disorders that can include depression and bipolar disorder. Um, Clay, you can take that down now if you don't mind. Um, so let me talk to you a little bit about, um, are you familiar, could you educate the jury as to what withdrawal symptoms of ketamine would look like? Yes, so uh, uh, so there's uh, there's no um, there's no real described ketamine withdrawal uh, constellation of symptoms, but the but what has been described are um, reactions of anxiety and uh, intense irritability. In terms of um ketamine being a disassociative drug, are there any specific risks of a patient taking a disassociative drug long-term? Objection I, I, Vegas, long-term. 
So I'll, I'll, let me specify my question to you, Dr. Lee. Have you been provided the records that have generally shown the doses of ketamine that Maya received from 2015 until her hospitalization in uh, All Children's in October of 2016? Yes, I have. In, in your review and your understanding based on your education, training, and experiences, uh, would you consider those doses of ketamine to be high? Yes, I would. Go ahead. You can answer, Doctor. I, it, yes, I would. I, the doses that I've seen reported, uh, in my opinion, are more similar to the kinds of exposures we see in people with ketamine addiction than we are uh, than the, the the lower doses that you would see when uh, people use ketamine for analgesia or pain control. Okay. Can, can somebody develop, well, I won't say somebody, but um, is there, a, can, can a person develop a tolerance to ketamine uh, based on chronic exposure? Injection foundation. Uh, overall. You can answer, doctor. Yes. Uh, tolerance is known to be associated with uh, chronic ketamine use. Um, there's also some reference in the record of uh, my receiving what's called a benzodiazepine. Are you familiar with those classes of drugs? Yes. And um, what are benzodiazepines? Oh, benzodiazepines are sedatives that are used to control uh, anxiety, um, and they're also anticonvulsants, and they're also used. Uh, yeah, they're also addictive. And I was going to ask you that question. Is there a risk of addiction with long-term use of benzodiazepines? Yes, there is. Okay. And um, are you familiar with the withdrawal symptoms of benzodiazepines? Yes, I am. And, and what do those symptoms look like? I, well, um, in benzodiazepines, we often see um, people experience anxiety, irritability, um, and they can have seizures from benzodiazepine withdrawal can actually be quite dangerous. So I want to talk to you a little bit about um, use of ketamine going forward. The jury has heard a recommendation that uh, Maya receive ketamine again, uh, based on a recommendation from Dr. Kirkpatrick for a certain period of time uh, into the future. Let me ask you this. Um, based on your training and experience, would you consider it to be dangerous for an adolescent like Maya to be chronically using ketamine in the future? Yes, I would. Okay, I and, would. and why? Well, I, I think, uh, so uh, ketamine is an addictive substance. Uh, Maya's already had a very extensive exposure. I would be concerned that uh, that uh, any chronic problems that, that she may be experiencing related to ketamine use um, could get worse. I would also be concerned that um, she could develop or worsen a substance use disorder to ketamine. And is there a particular concern about starting a, uh, a significant ketamine dose around her age at age 18 during that adolescent period that would be unique to that period of life? Uh, so, uh, yes, there is. Again, you know, the, the uh, risk of developing a substance use disorder is much higher among um, adolescents and young adults. Um, so, you know, I think that there would be real concerns about using uh, a drug like ketamine, certainly in high doses in somebody in this age range. Okay. Um, I appreciate your time, doctor. Those are the questions I have at this point. I may have some um, after plaintiff's counsel ask you questions. Thank you.